All right, so now we're going to talk about those upper airway emergencies, and this is where we're talking about toddlers and small children that like to put things in their mouth, uh, be it exploring or just being absent about whether or not uh, that should actually be in their mouth and it, can it cause some kind of significant problem if it's inadvertently uh, potentially swallowed or uh, inhaled into the upper respiratory tract. The signs and symptoms are decreased or absent breath sounds and or strider. Uh, and the strider being the big telltale sign, this is caused by anything that's inside the body. Uh, it could be from a foreign uh, uh, debris or it could be some kind of mucus or swelling. The foreign body aspiration or obstructions can be caused by anything that they can fit in their mouth. Uh, this could be quarters, marbles, soda caps, uh, you name it. If they can get it into their mouth and it's small enough to get back into the throat, it can become an obstruction. Uh, blood or vomit, teeth, uh, any of these other things that can do that, like I said just a few seconds ago, can also become this airway obstruction. Although they're not te technically foreign, uh, they can be removed with suctioning or the appropriate management. If we can, we wanna to try to get these children to cough. We don't want to intervene unless we're trying to give some kind of supplemental oxygen. If they have strider, they're obviously moving air at some capacity and we're gonna wait until things get worse before we try to get anywhere near being invasive. And uh, unfortunately, AEMTs do not have the scope to do any kind of deep um, McGill forceps for removing these foreign bodies and we really don't want to actually try to violate that at any point in time. Uh, this is going to come down to when a child starts to become unconscious you might go into chest compressions. So this is that uh, infant or very small child kind of uh, clearing the airway. Remember the back blows and then the five chest thrusts. This is kind of par for the course anytime that we're dealing with CPR in uh, small children, infants, toddlers, uh, or, or the like. All right, now we're gonna move into anaphylaxis and we're gonna talk about anaphylaxis because this is one of those true life-threatening emergencies in children. I mean, it really is in adults as well, but because of the respiratory component being so significant in an anaphylactic reaction, remember that anaphylaxis causing respiratory uh, failure is gonna cause that kind of uh, cardiac failure. We're just gonna say it one more time. Most children who have some kind of cardiopulmonary arrest are secondary to respiratory arrest. And anaphylaxis can easily re uh, basically lead to that situation. Now your primary survey may show you hives, swelling of the lips and the oral mucosa, strider and wheezing and diminished pulses. What I'm trying to make sure that everybody understands is you do not have to see all three, right? I don't need to see hypotension, respiratory problems, and urticaria. If I have any kind of swelling to the face or around the mouth or even around the neck or significant urticaria up the chest uh, nearing the head, I'm already looking at this. This is telling me that I've got a problem, right? If I get anything that's a little bit more than just the localized swelling from say perhaps a bee sting or something like that, already suspecting that we're going that route of anaphylaxis. So make sure that you're looking at this and treat this aggressively. You never wanna get behind on an anaphylactic situation, especially in children. Okay, as we've talked about several times throughout this lecture, uh, we're gonna go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Uh, we're gonna talk about respiratory disease processes that are gonna cause obstructions. The first one is gonna be croup, and this is an infection of the upper airway, and it's below the level of the vocal cords. But what I want everybody to remember again is that with the inflammation from the infection, we're actually losing the diameter of the lumen. And this is in the main area of the airway, right? This is the trachea and the main bronchi. Uh, they're all going to start actually having this inflammation. We can get swelling in the neck and the soft tissues of the throat. So remember that the edema is what's causing the progressive airway obstruction. And this is really one of those things that we wanna kind of like jump on and get them to the appropriate facility because we don't have the ability to actually treat this very well. Now, when we're dealing with a child who has croup, we're gonna allow that child to assume a position of comfort. We're not gonna put them in a specific position. We're gonna to try to make sure that they're being transported to where they're not becoming upset. That crying, which can cause more infl inflammation of the airway, 
uh, where the throat and the mouth are going to complicate the situation. Humidified oxygen can provide a little bit of soothing action, although it's not going to reduce the actual swelling or the inflammation. Uh, there are specific medications that can be inhaled for that, uh, that at this point are kind of paramedic only levels. Uh, and so that's why you may want to call for a paramedic backup if you need that nebulized epi or what we would call a, a, a racemic epi to kind of reduce the inflammation. And, and the reason that, that we're using that nebulized epi is because the epi is causing vasoconstriction, which is pulling the inflammation or reducing the swelling of the actual airway. Epiglottitis is a little bit of a different disease process. This is where we have inflammation of the epiglottis and the child is gonna have a little bit different of a look to them. They're really not gonna to wanna to swallow. You're gonna see that they're drooling quite a bit. Uh, and this again can be kind of treated the exact same way in the case of the AEMT. Second verse, the same as the first, this is the position of comfort. Make sure that they're allowed to drool, that you do not want to try to force them to swallow anything. We're not trying to make them upset. What we don't want is a child that's crying and then with epiglottitis, because it's inflamed and there's a lot of mucus, we can actually get this to where the epiglottis wants to kind of snap shut. And then it's not going to want to lift or break away from the uh, trachea. And we can actually cause uh, the kind of an internal suffocation on this particular patient. So keeping this particular patient really calm and getting them to the appropriate facility is probably your best bet in dealing with that. Okay, so unfortunately something happened in the slide here. We've got a little bit of overlap, but now we're talking about lower airway emergencies. And this is where we're talking about pneumonia or other kind of respiratory infections. And this is where we really wanna make sure that we're auscultating breath sounds and listen at both sides, right? They have much smaller lung capacity. So if we have some kind of adventitious lung sounds, that's something we wanna know right now because we wanna get in front of this and make sure that we're actually dealing with this before uh, they end up with a significant amount of pneumonia. Remember that little ones like this, uh, when they have these respiratory problems, they can become sick and uh, have the respiratory issue take on that cardiopulmonary issue right in front of your eyes. Now, in the cases of asthma, Asthma actually tends to be significantly more prevalent in children. Uh, there are a lot more things that kind of trigger asthmatic conditions in children. And then there is a significant portion of the population that uh, they may have had childhood asthma, but they've outgrown those things or are able to compensate to such a degree that you would never know that they even have a mild asthmatic condition. Now, acute uh, spasming and inflammation of the bronchioles is uh, one of the first signs and symptoms that's going on and then they start to produce this excessive mucus and the reason for this is whatever the offending agent is that's going into the lungs is causing this reaction right this is uh, kind of like an antigen so to speak and the body will start spasming and then constricting the bronchioles down trying to reduce the ability for that uh, kind of irritant to get into the alveoli and then the, the lung tissue will start producing mucus to try to protect and then engulf and uh, like use that as a means for them to cough and uh, like uh, eject this offending agent the triggers are typically upper respiratory infections, allergies, or environmental things. Uh, there can be some exercise-induced asthma as well as, as some kind of emotional stress. The uh, signs and symptoms of the acute asthma attack obviously is gonna be some kind of strider. If the child is sitting up in some kind of tripoding or preferential uh, positioning, they have obvious respiratory distress. Uh, because asthma is an air trapping phenomenon, as far as the disease process, they're gonna have a prolonged expiratory phase. They're trying to force that gas exchange because they do not have the ability to get gas exchange through that mucus or the de decreased uh, amount of alveolar space because of the bronchoconstriction. The strider or wheezing is obvious. They're gonna have that inflammation and tightening of the upper airway. They'll be tachycardic because they're actually uh, now having that poor gas exchange and then they're breathing quickly because whatever tissue they actually have left for gas exchange needs to have a rapid uh, diffusion process. They are obviously gonna be agitated because they feel like they're suffocating.
You always want to make sure that you're getting oxygen on board in the case of an asthmatic because a low O2 sat is generally a late stage or sign of asthma and we're really kind of behind the cuff on that one and this is tough to actually get these uh, nebulized medications in for them uh, because they're so closed down that we actually can't get it to the places that we want it to be. Uh, and in the case of a, a significant asthmatic, uh, we just really want to go towards that epi because we're going to kind of deal with the airway uh, intramuscularly by giving them that small uh, bolus, uh, or I should say small dose of epi. And then as they start to open back up, we can get that nebulized albuterol. And in some cases, depending on age and your protocols, you can give them epitropium to try to keep those uh, airways open and uh, relaxed. In the cases of severe asthma, make sure that you may have a paramedic backup because the, these patients may need to have an ET tube placed. Uh, I know in our state, uh, pediatric intubation is no longer permissible, uh, but in other areas of the country, this is probably still practiced and it may be the only thing that you have uh, in regards to being able to uh, save this person's life. So I didn't cover a lot of the uh, sicknesses like pneumonia and things of that nature because it's very similar to an adult. Uh, small children are much more prone to respiratory disease processes than the adults are. And that's just specifically due to the immune system not being as uh, well developed as it, you are in, as an adult. Uh, but one thing that we do want to make sure that we're talking about is pertussis. Uh, and this is spread by a bacteria and it's in respiratory droplets. And uh, everybody should get their pertussis vaccination uh, as needed because uh, it, it can significantly impact small children and elderly patients alike. So the other term for pertussis is the whooping cough, uh, and you'll kind of hear that uh, kind of craning sound as they're uh, coughing during the inspiratory phase. And these patients uh, are actually still communicable in as far as uh, spreading the disease. So make sure that you're standing uh, using the standard precautions, which is at a minimum, you should have a uh, procedure mask on yourself and quite often what we like to do is to put a procedure mask over a non-rebreather when we're doing our breathing treatments with the uh, person who has this particular process, uh, disease. All right, when we're dealing with airway adjuncts, if you're in lab with me, you obviously understand how to appropriately size your airway adjuncts. And this comes all the way down to an OPA and being able to identify what those adjuncts look like and how you would actually uh, put that in your chart, right? So uh, all of the adjuncts that you have are sized and they actually have some kind of identification marker on them. Make sure that you know them and you know approximately how to size those appropriately. Uh, as you can see on here, this uh, particular person's using a Braslau tape. Uh, this is really not the end all be all as far as sizing your adjuncts. You should be able to do this by just knowing your tools uh, and every tool that we have in our arsenal should have some kind of good training that came with it so that you understand how to quickly and efficiently get it sized up for your patient. Okay, a couple of small ways to get oxygen. This is no different than anything else, but uh, if you're looking at this, you can see the makeshift blow-by device, uh, which is the uh, clear plastic cup that has some uh, tubing running into it. Uh, if they're not gonna let you put a nasal cannula on them, uh, Adult nasal cannulas and pediatric nasal cannulas are really kind of different in size just due to the actual lumen diameter. Uh, you may be able to just cut down the tips of a adult nasal cannula just to kind of make them not protrude into the nares so much and get a child to wear one of those, although it still may be a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, if it's uh, available and appropriate, try to get them on the uh, appropriate size nasal cannula or non-rebreather. Now, if we're talking about BVMing, again, the size of the bag is gonna be dictated by what your service carries. Uh, we absolutely wanna make sure that we're using a neonatal bag for neonates, and we're using a pediatric bag for basically anybody from uh, about one year of age up. Uh, and you, know, you can actually use these on adults with great success, so long as the mask is at the appropriate size. Uh, and again, this is something that you're gonna talk to your service provider about or they'll tell you uh, what it is that your medical director wants you to use.
BVMing is actually best done with two people. One to hold the mask with a good seal to the face, the other one to actually time and deal with the ventilation of the bag. So if you can do uh, BVMing with two people because you have enough people to help, that's the best way to get it done so that you're doing it effectively. Uh, again, this is really one of those things where we're trying to kind of get people to get them into position. All too often we forget about patting behind the head or behind the shoulders, depending on the age of the patient, and then getting them into that sniffing position or a neutral inline position. This is one of the, the, the first things that somebody should be doing if they're the first person on the BVM. And then after they get, get the head and the airway into alignment, they're gonna hold the mask down against the face uh, or hold some of the jaw up against the mask because uh, what tends to end up happening is that when you're a single person BVMing, you're gonna push the mask down against the face because it's really difficult to do that EC technique very well. And so what will end up happening is the head will roll forward towards the chest and then we actually end up pinching off the airway. It's very cumbersome to deal with. So again, this slide hits the nail on the head. If you got two people that can deal with ventilating, put two people on ventilating. If we go into CPR, that's go time. Every one of you guys has a CPR card right now, so I expect I don't have to go through this very uh, significantly because you should be uh, good at this. You've already tested out on it. Okay, in regards to IV catheters, we don't start a whole lot of IVs on pediatrics. Uh, they're generally not very happy about you sticking them. So make sure that you're looking at the, the specific type of catheter that you're using. Uh, there are plenty of children who are toddlers that can take an 18 gauge catheter in say the AC or the saphenous vein. Uh, but more often than not, you're gonna use a 22 or a 24 gauge catheter because uh, they have smaller diameter, uh, you know, uh, veins, and we really don't want to blow them. If you can't get your stick on the first try, it's very rare that a child who has any kind of uh, mental faculties is going to let you go for another one. So uh, know your tools and be very good at your IV skills. Uh, sometimes butterfly catheters are really kind of a lifesaver for you, uh, but most services aren't carrying those in the back of the truck because we're using a true IV catheter. Fluid control is really important in pediatrics. It does not take a lot of fluid to harm a child. Uh, I would challenge you to think about a six pound baby getting a liter of fluid on accident because you did not control your fluids. Uh, you will actually end up killing that child. So if you're in lab with me, we go over fluid sets like almost continuously. Uh, the big thing that you want to know is uh, what a Biratrol is and how it's used. It's actually got a 60 drop set on it and for the most part most Biratrols will only take 150 mLs of fluid in total uh, and you want to lock off your bag from that and generally what I tell my students in lab is is that you should be able to figure out what your maximum bolus is gonna be on your patient based on their weight, and you should really never hang a bag any bigger than that uh, on that particular patient. So if we have a child who is at maximum gonna get a 250 bag, uh, that should be what they have hanging against them, uh, unless obviously you're gonna give them massive amounts of fluid because you're trying to fight some kind of bleed or something like that, and we can't get it clamped down. Uh, but for the most part, we're gonna use the appropriate bag and it's gonna get delivered through Biratrol with a 60 drop set. We have so much control by using the Biratrol with the 60 drop set and the prescribed dose uh, being set at 100 to 150 mLs that it's really hard to get a runaway bag. Uh, there have been several cases where you know, a two or a three year old child has a liter bag hanging against them. And uh, you know, the provider looks up and sees six, 700 mLs have run in because they actually didn't have it clamped down quite well enough or got busy looking or doing something else. Uh, so we don't want that to be an issue. So my general rule of thumb again is the bag should be no larger than what you're gonna have for a maximum fluid bolus you should have a Buratrol. And at the very least, if you have say a 250 bag or a 100 ml bag, it should only be coming through a micro drip tubing because again, it's gonna slow down how quickly you can get that fluid into the patient. 
Vasculature is really no different than an adult. It's all going to be in the same place. It's just going to be smaller. So you're looking for the larger vessels that you can find. You can see right there the greater saphenous vein. That's going to come down the medial side of the ankle. It is probably one of the larger veins you're going to catch in a, a small child. And then you can look at the cephalic vein or the uh, basilic vein in the upper arm. This is really probably your kind of go-to shot in a small child as well. In regards to IO, uh, IO is probably a really, really good thing to have uh, anytime that you're dealing with a child because, again, I would never want a, a AEMT to waste a lot of time on a patient who really has to have fluid access or some kind of medication port access. Uh, if you're spending several t attempts trying to get this uh, IV catheter into a vein, uh, we could already have the IO done. Now, what you're looking at in the picture here is the Easy IO. The Easy IO is quickly becoming the industry standard. There is its own process in doing it. Uh, but uh, in my lab, I'll teach you uh, the differences between the bone injection gun, the Easy IO, and then the uh, jam sheety or the Illinois bone needle. All of them have their place. All of them are proven. They're all functional as far as IO insertion. Uh, I will say that right now, uh, just because we use the uh, Easy IO ourselves, the pink or the pediatric it basically isn't even sold anymore. The blue needle goes all the way down to newborn weight for a normal size newborn. And so the uh, most services don't even carry the, the actual pink uh, trochanters anymore. Now on this slide, it says IO infusion is contraindicated if you have a secure IV. That's not actually true. Uh, multiple lines depending on what kind of patient you have. Uh, now, if you can get that quick and easy IV, we don't actually want to take the risk of uh, harming a child by doing the uh, IO. Uh, the fracture, possible fracture, uh, is really a low kind of possibility uh, for the most part. We're talking about a 15-gauge uh, needle uh, that is being placed into the bone. Uh, the idea that you would end up with a fracture over it is very, very low to almost non, like non-existent. Most IOs are going to be in the proximal tibia. Depending on your service, you may have other places that you're allowed to go for access. And then uh, IOs are actually self-stabilizing, but you want to make sure that you immobilize and pat around it so that you don't hit it. Because what we don't want is to have a uh, actual shear. Um, another thing that uh, a lot of people need to know is that the maximum time duration for an IO is 72 hours. And so anytime you place an IO, that actually has to be labeled with some kind of time stamp somewhere so that they know that that needs to be removed. All right, my favorite thing to talk about, which is altered mental status. This is how I assess almost all of my patients right out of the gate. Uh, when I walk in, I'm looking for their mental status because their mental status is telling me everything that I really need to know about a patient initially, which is if they have a mental status, that means that they have a pulse and that they're breathing. They are perfusing at some point. So uh, this is one of the very first things that I'm obviously trying to do on my primary uh, survey or my across the room kind of look. And then I love the mnemonic AEIOU tips. Uh, I've gone over this, I don't know how many times in the previous lectures. This is something that you guys should have committed to memory because it is the multiple diagnostic tip for you to get through so that you can figure out why somebody does not have the appropriate mentation. So while I'm not going to go back through it again, uh, I, you can see it's on the slide. It's a valuable tool. I really, really encourage all of you to know this and to use it on a regular basis. All right, some of the things to talk about as far as uh, neurologic emergencies. Uh, again, if you've been following the slides, you can see I'm not touching all of them because a lot of them we've already covered in other chapters and it's the exact same material as the adult, which would be your, your seizures and things like that, right? So, so long as you're using AEIU tips, we can get through it and figure out where we're at and what we need to do. Now in meningitis, this happens a lot in children. This is an inf inflammation of the meninges and it's caused by an infection by bacteria, virus, or fungi, or sometimes parasites. If it's untreated, it can lead to brain damage and death. So this is your greater risk population. Males, newborn infants, prior histories of meningitis. They live in crowded conditions. They do not receive their proper immunizations or they have a really poor immune system. 
there could be some kind of history or trauma uh, or of brain surgery, which may have opened up that particular tissue to the outside environment, uh, or they have some kind of hydrocephaly, which requires a shunt, some kind of pins or other foreign bodies within the brain or the spinal cord. That's a lot of stuff for you to try to figure out. Uh, big things on meningitis is uh, cough, fever, and really, really a stiff neck. Uh, and then you'll see that there are some uh, skin kind of rash or modeling that you'll see on some patients here in the next slide or two. Uh, fever, headache, altered level of consciousness, sometimes seizures. This is when they're pretty significant, uh, especially in children with the febrile seizures. Uh, younger than two to three months, they can end up going apneic. And then uh, they're uh, bulging fontanelles without crying. And here we go with that kind of uh, modeling along the skin you can see here. And as I'm looking at this picture, it looks like the, they were probably going for some kind of central line. Uh, it appears to me that that looks like it's iodine along the crease of the leg uh, into the pelvis. Now, one thing I do wanna say is anytime that we suspect meningitis, we wanna make sure that we keep the patient covered up, right? If they're coughing, they are very highly likely to transmit this to you. Adults that catch uh, meningitis, uh, will very often be exceptionally sick and face significant risk of death.